Thank you. Unfortunately, you've got me only because Richard's got the flu. So, um, you might feel that this is a bit of a downer after the last lovely visual stuff. I'm vision impaired, so I see the world slightly differently and I do things slightly differently. Um, oh, sorry, there you are. Um, so, um, who's in, who's out? Who are the people who have the biggest problems with using their, um, yeah, next one, with using, using digital material? So, um, there are certain groups of populations that don't have the same access to all the lovely technology and all the lovely visual stuff. Um, I'm, uh, my experience is with the disability community, so I'm going to um, rely on them um, and talk about them more than the other groups. Okay, so nearly one quarter of New Zealanders are disabled. Now, most of you may not think about that, but many of them face barriers to using the net, as do older people. Um, and so one of the things that's really important is that um, you can't access them necessarily through service providers, you can't access them necessarily through their own organisations, or even through Arts Access Aotearoa, um, but you have to do your work in accessing this population. You have to grow them and retain them. Lots of people have barriers to using the web. Um, they're many and they're different and they interact with each other. Um, many people use assistive technology and also many people have more than one impairment as well, just to complicate things. Um, many people use assistive technology, which may or may not work with the material that you have unless you've thought about it from the start. Um, others have um, all sorts of barriers to using technology. They may not know what's accessible. They may not know how to make what you're doing accessible for them. They may not know their options. So there's a variety of digital solutions. The next one, thanks. A variety of digital solutions for these. Um, so one of the things that's really important is to actually include accessibility from the start of any project, right from your design brief, right through from day one. So think about who's going to be using it. Make your websites accessible. Um, there are many ways that you can do this. You can use photo photographs um, and illustrations have text alternatives. Um, think about keyboard users, heading structures, all of those really boring things, but really essential to make a good experience for everyone. Plain language, um, colour contrast, all of those things. Um, audio description, and we're going to see some of that in a minute, hopefully. Um, we have audio describers in Wellington, in Auckland, in Christchurch, and I think in Dunedin as well. Captioning can be done on YouTube, but be warned. It often comes out garbage and you have to fix it, so don't trust them. Um, use sign language wherever possible. We'll see some examples of that too. Plain language and easy read. Easy read and plain language are not the same thing. Um, there's also a number of really interesting technologies out there that are really useful. Petoni Museum is using eye beacons as a means of showing people, blind people around their exhibitions. They'll even lend you an, uh, a phone, a smartphone if you haven't got one because they're too expensive still for some people. Unfortunately, there's nothing on their website about it, so you wouldn't know. Um, okay, next one. Oh, right, we're there. Um, National Library, as you'll see there, every of the, all of their exhibitions, and this is the, was the Tira Here Mai exhibition a couple of years ago, where somebody had the great idea of putting all our three official languages next to each other. And you don't often see them together. I found it quite moving the first time I saw it. So having our three national languages, and you'll note there the creative use of the iPad, simple, simple really, with, with what is really accessible technology out of the box. So now we come to the video clip, and I hope it will work. An elevator descends. On the street, there's gold lettering on a building, Isaac Theatre Royal. Inside the foyer, the cameraman and boom operator exit a glass elevator. They're followed closely by Jared Flitcroft, filmmaker, and Lee Chin Heng, PhD candidate. She's in a wheelchair. Jared is now seated. Moko cover both his forearms. He gestures using New Zealand Sign Language. 
It's my passion, really. That's why I do it. I love making films. I think it's really, really important to show different perspectives within the films. I think with art, with access to art, of utmost importance is having an interpreter. It's really important. Deaf people really need the communication. We want to know, like for example, the theatre, we need interpreting so we can get the show. Or in an art gallery, if a person's talking about the art, then we need that told to us through an interpreter. If there's no interpreter, then it's just hopeless. Communication is very important. I love having access to art. And it's very good when we have someone there to interpret for us. And if there are movies or TV shows, subtitles are very important as well. Extremely important, so we can see and understand clearly what's being said. So captioning and audio description, audio description does for, um, for blind people what captioning does for deaf people. It gives you the visual things that you need to know to hold the story together. This next example is of um, a tour we did last year at Te Papa. These examples are pretty much all in New Zealand, all things that are being done here, where 3D printing was used to replicate one of the um, one of the items we were, we were there to see, but it, 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 wasn't, it was a bigger thing than that. It was a fire screen and it was a beautiful shape and it just, like many things in museums, just asked to be touched. So a bit of 3D printing and we could actually feel the shape of it as we talked about the, the item and what it is and what it does. Sorry, my iPad's gone to sleep. Um, so, the next one is actually an example. By the way, that video we watched, um, Arts Access Aotearoa has it on the website and we'll give you the website and things at the end, the links. Um, this is a digitally sculptured artwork for blind people. Um, it's, it, this is not a New Zealand example, this is something from the States where a company has decided that blind people should have access to all the great um, artworks of the world. And so they've, they are now making digital um, copies of artworks so people can feel the detail and feel, touch the things that other people can see. Um, we, we talked about wayfinding earlier. I talked about using um, a um, eye beacons in the Petoni Museum. This is a system that's used um, in Wellington now. It's called Blind Square, and it's a wayfinding system that uses your smartphone if you're lucky enough to have one and can afford them. With all the, because they're really expensive with all the accessibility gizmos. Um, this is um, enables people to move around their communities and move within their communities and access things inside buildings as well as find their way around buildings and around the streets. So this is the kind of thing that has application now in our museums and galleries. You don't need a lot of fancy technology. It's one of the things that I think has changed so much um, in the last little while since I've been working in accessibility, which is you know over, over nearly 20 years. The, the, the inclusion technology has changed just as much as the rest of the technology has changed. Disabled people are demanding more access. And in fact, if you, if you incorporate universal design into your, into your programs, into the work that you do digitally, then there'll be, then universal design means that anything you're doing for other people who have more difficulty accessing things is not special, it's just part of the way things are done. So that kind of technology can be adapted and used. And if you, I'm sure there are people around Wellington who'd be happy to show you how it works if you're interested. The next, this is sign DNA. We talked about the importance of sign language earlier. And this is sign DNA, which is a website belonging to the deaf community. It's their 
deaf archive. It's their sign language archive. New Zealand has a very unique sign language history, which is quite different from many other countries for some historical reasons, which would take me too long to tell you now. If you're interested, I, you can catch me at some of the breaks. But it has a very interesting sign language history, and they're gathering up as much of it as they can on the sign DNA website. So they're telling their stories in their own way, which is not very common in our community. Many of our stories are actually lost. So the, so the exhibition um, of the soldiers, the, um, the um, sorry, Oops. the road to recovery, and I thought it was really interesting that this is about disabled soldiers from World War I, many of whom had some pretty horrible injuries, not to mention what they used to call shell shock, but it's now PTSD. Um, they, um, and it was really interesting, it was called the problem of the dis disabled soldier, which I thought was a really interesting way of describing these men who'd come back. They weren't the, they weren't the, the, um, the glorious fallen and they weren't the glorious survivors. They were the ones that made you feel uncomfortable to look at. And you could see, um, I couldn't access, ironically, any of the print information that went with it, but I could, even I could see the looks on their faces and the looks in their eyes, which were quite moving and powerful. And it's good to see that Te Papa made a start on our history because our history is hidden. And um, what a country, what a nation chooses to remember is important. And we've lost a lot of history. We've lost a lot of um, the women, the people who were, the blind people who were looked after from the cradle to the grave. They've all gone now. I wish I'd done an, an oral history. Um, also, the history of the bins, uncomfortable as it is, we're discovering other history. But um, the history of the bins is another whole area that's been brushed under the carpet in a way. But that was a great start, and I think a really important start to looking at disability history, to digitising our history and discovering it in ways that we can all access. So finally, um, that's probably just about wrapped it up for me. Um, arts Access Aotearoa is worth joining. They have an Arts for All network. I, I would thoroughly recommend it to you. It's a great place to make connections. It's a great place to find out what's going on, share ideas, find out what's happening internationally. The Arts for All book has got a number of really good resources in there, both digital and otherwise, international standards, and so on. So um, I recommend Arts Access Aotearoa to you, and also Access if you want to do some accessibility work. But you'll have to do some of it yourself too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.